welcome to Trails to Fame. Today's special guest, none other than the Hall of Fame and Grand Ole Opry musician, Jerry Braswell. Jerry Braswell, a native of Northwest Georgia, ventured to Nashville, Tennessee, where he spent over a 50-year career in the music business, playing for the iconic artists such as Ernest Tubb, Jim Ed Brown, Helen Cornelius, and the Grand Ole Opry legend Porter Wagner, just to name a few. Now, let's sit back and talk to the Hall of Fame member, Jerry Braswell. Wow, got Mr. Jerry Braswell with us here today. <laughs> Welcome to Trails to Fame. We're so well, glad you're here. Thank you, sir. Living legend. I tell you, I I've, I've been reading and <laughs> been watching your career for so many years. Worked with some of the greatest. Been around since dirt. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you're probably one of the most famous persons so far we've had on this show. Uh, what's it been like traveling all around the world doing shows? Fortunately, it has allowed me to be in every state in the Union in several foreign countries. Wow. Otherwise, I wouldn't got to do that. Well, tell me this. How did you get started in the music? Now, you, do you come from a family of music? No. Uh, I started out as a kid with my sisters and my family doing gospel music and learned how to, I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. And finally, Daddy, finally, after all these years, in fact, Joey and I was talking about it earlier, I've got my guitar that my daddy gave me with 1947 wow. Gibson. It's been, it's in the shop now, been, been re, redone. I finally got it back after all these years. Uh, and I wanted to be in the music industry, and I didn't care what part, just as long as I could be in the music industry. And I met this young guy in Atlanta, I was living here in Atlanta, and I met this young guy in Atlanta. He had just signed a, country, uh, a, a record deal with Columbia Records. Uh, his name was David Rogers. And he asked me if I would like to go to work with him as playing bass. Well, I'd never played bass in my life. <laughs> but it was the opportunity for me to get an opportunity to go into the music industry. And I traveled with him several years until some other opportunities began to open up for me, and that, that gave me an opportunity to go up. Yeah, so David Rogers, I've, uh, you know, know, I've been listening to his music for years, too. He had a lot of records, and used part of a lot of those records. And I was on some of them That's records. That's right. One of his, what's it, one of his famous ones, is it? Uh, she Don't Make Me Cry was yeah, one of them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was, to me, that was one of the better songs that he did, but he, he had some, he had some good, good records. Wow. So, um, I know you play instruments, you know, of course, with a guitar and a bass, but what all other kind of instruments do you play? I can tell you what kind of instruments I own. Okay. <laughs> I have a keyboard. In fact, I have two keyboards. Uh, I started out as a drummer, and I still got a set of drums. Like, in fact, I got a couple of sets of drums that, that I, I, I enjoy piddling with. Uh, Guitar, bass. I, I, I've owned several fiddles and several banjos, but I've never been able to to put that together. I've just basically hung with the guitars, and I'm not. I'm not. I can sit down and chord a piano, but I'm not a piano player. Yeah. Well, I know you mentioned David Rogers. Tell me some other artists you got to tour along with and play with. Well, in my early career. Uh, that was a time a lot of the younger people were getting started, such as Jeannie C. Riley, uh, Crystal Gale, uh, and I, I worked a lot of dates with them because at the time they couldn't afford to carry a band. Uh, they were new artists and they were trying to get started and uh, got to work with the, my favorite singer in the world, Melba Montgomery. Love Melba uh, Montgomery. Oh, or Montgomery. Yeah. Oh, love her to death. And uh, Diane McCall, 
she used to sing a lot of stuff with George Jones and also with uh, uh, Charlie Leuven. Uh, fantastic voice. Uh, but I, 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 just, I used to freelance a lot. Uh, 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 I was with one of the first bands that Donna Fargo put together. Wow. Uh, didn't stay there long. I, I didn't, her husband and I didn't see eye to eye, so I felt like it was time for me to go back. So I went back to working with David uh, until the opportunity, I got an opportunity to go to work for Dale Reeves, so I went to work with Dale and uh, stayed there for three or four years and moved to California. I thought I thought there'd be more money for me in California. <laughs> I went out there and couldn't find any picking gigs, but I found a job at, for a TV station working as talent coordinator. And uh, I ended up, it, uh, California wasn't my, wasn't my place, wasn't my cup of tea, so to speak. And I moved back to Nashville and I called Dale Reeves before I left and asked him, I said, ask him if he had filled the, my position. And he said, yeah, but let me call you back. And he, a few minutes later, he called me back and gave me a telephone number. He said, call this number when you get back. And I called the number and it was Bob Lumen. And I got the opportunity to work with Bob Lumen for a short period of time. And then I went to work for uh, Jim Ed Brown. And I was with Jim Ed when he and Helen, uh, in fact, <laughs> Jim Ed came home one day after a, after a session. He said, listen to this and tell, you, tell me what you think. And they had just recorded, uh, I don't want to have to marry you. And I listened to it and I gave it back to him. I said, I don't think it's going to sell. <laughs> well, I guess that kind of proved me wrong because it was a number one record for him. Yep. And uh, I stayed with Jim Ed for about seven years. And uh, I, uh, Royce Kendall of, of the Kendalls, Royce called me and wanted me to help him put a sound system together. And I helped him do that. And uh, while I was doing that, I, I, t I told Royce I would only be there for six months. And when uh, I came back from working with Royce, uh, the position came open with Porter. And I went to work for Porter and stayed with Porter for a while. And, and he let all the guys go and hired all the girls. Well, I was the only guy that he kept with him because he needed somebody to go with him to take care of all the needs of the girls. And I didn't last long there. And uh, I, I, I was working, and now all these artists that I've worked with also were members of the Opry. So I worked the Opry for 20 years. Wow. And. Uh, as long as the artist was working the Opry, I was working the Opry. And the night that I left Porter, Justin Tubb came up to me and he said, Jerry, he said, how would you like to become a troubadour? And I said, I'd love to become a troubadour. He said, well, I can't make that happen. He said, but my daddy can. So he took me and introduced me to Ernest. And I got that was the most different interview I've ever had with an artist. I walked in, he was, he, was, he was extremely ill at that time. He was in a hospital bed in his, in his room. And of course they had all kinds of things run into him for tubes and stuff. And I walked in and he looked at me, he said, you like country music, boy? I said, yes, sir. He said, would you like to be a troubadour? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, Justin will teach you how to become one. And, uh, I was there, I guess, four months and Ernest passed away. And I, uh, all of the troubadours were, were uh, 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 not, uh, we were pallbearers, we were honorary pallbearers. And uh, I never got to work with Ernest, but uh, I did get to see him before he passed away. Uh, that, was, that was one of the best, best jobs you could have ever had. But now a lot of these artists that I work with, I also recorded with them too. Uh, not all of them, but some of them I did. Uh, I, I did with David, I did with Dale. I did some, a couple of things with Jim Ed. Uh, I didn't do anything with Bob. Uh, but I, I did, fortunately, 
uh, the good Lord gave me a decent voice, and I was able to do a lot of harmony stuff behind some of the artists. Uh, Porter used to do a lot of what they call uh, customs, uh, custom records, and he would use me a lot doing vocal backup and stuff with some of the stuff that he did. Uh, I've had a fun, I've had a fun career. Uh, I, I've been able to travel. I did. I, I traveled a lot with the USO shows. Uh, son, that was you talking about some some fun time, man. I mean, you work with. I got to sing with the my all time favorite group. Uh, if if you remember the song "Only You," yes, I got to sing that with the original Platters. Now there ain't too daggum many people that can say that, but but uh, we was on an airplane. We was going to Hawaii to do a big, big show there for the military. And Lord knows you wouldn't believe all the talent that was on that thing, but that whole plane was taken up by the artist that was going there to be a part of that show. And uh, I noticed these, this guy got on and I kept thinking to myself, I know this guy. I, I, I don't know where I know him, but I know him. And I kept looking and, and of course they were was getting everybody seated and as soon as everybody was seated and we was ready to, and we took off I got up and I walked up there and just as I got up there I noticed who it was and I said you're Ernie <laughs> and he in his real deep voice he said yes I am he said now do you know who you are I said yes sir I do I said but I said I just had to come and I noticed sitting right beside him was Zoe uh, the, 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 the female vocalist that was in with that group at that time and over across the aisle, the two others were sitting on the other side. And I said, man, I said, you guys are my all-time favorite group. And I said, y'all do a song that just blows my mind away. And he said, what do you got? I said, only you. And he, did, he took it, pointed the boy, and he said, kick it. And he goes to singing, man, all the way to Hawaii. There was so many groups. Gladys Knight and the Pips was on that show. Uh, they was all kind of all kind of people on the show, and uh, when I, when the stewardess came on on the uh, on the microphone, uh, as we was getting to, to Hawaii, we was about to land, and she said, "Ladies and gentlemen," she said, "Everybody, please get back in your seat." She said, "You have had more than a million dollars worth of entertainment today for nothing." <laughs> she said, "Let's get them all a round of applause." And I. Well, everybody in there was basically was was musicians or tied to the music industry in some way, but they sure gave them a round of applause, and they sure was good. But they did let me sing with them that day, and and I can say actually say I sang with the original Platter. Put that on your resume. There ain't too many people believe that. You know, I know this that you're still on TV. On RFD TV, we're still picking up the Porter Wagner show, and you're still on there. How does that? make you feel when you get tuned in and see well when i get that check each you know when I, I, they send it out either every six months or every year whatever it's whatever they can justify i guess but i did nashville on the road for seven years with jim ed and helen and jerry clowers and and wendy hokum right um i did that for seven years and that was fun anytime you can turn it anytime i can turn the tv on and watch myself I get to, I, I pick myself to death. I said, man, I should have done this or I should have done that or I shouldn't have done that or whatever. <laughs> you know, it, um, it gives you an opportunity to see what other people see that you do. Uh, the, the greatest thing that I can say that I ever accomplished by that was I've been around some great players and, and they have taught me more than I could ever pay for. Uh, I'm not telling you I'm that good of a musician, but what the musician I am is because of everybody that gave me their time and their knowledge. Uh, you can't buy that. <laughs> and if you could, I don't know what you'd have to pay for it. Yep. But it was it's it's always fun to watch something that you've done. I was one day I was. Somebody would say, well, you've played with just about anybody, everybody. And I said, and I got to thinking about that. And I, and I thought, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I don't think I ever worked with George Jones. And uh, so I went 
to the catalogs and started looking through the catalogs of all the shows that we did with Nashville on the Road, and, and sure enough, I worked with George Jones. And, and uh, I, I just got to thinking how lucky I was with the individuals. I worked with Gene Watson when he was nothing, when he was just, when he was just starting out. Nobody really knew who Gene Watson was. Uh, that's an honor. Anybody that I worked with was an honor. Uh, great musicians. I mean, uh, when you play with someone that, that, that went to the Juilliard or Philadelphia School of Music uh, and, and, and graduated, uh, they know a lot. And, and if they want to take the time to show me something or teach me something, I'm willing to learn it. I don't know if I could now. Well, I'm getting too old to try to remember. That's good. <laughs> I would like to think that I could. <laughs> it's it was just, it was just, it's been a fun life. I did it for 20 years straight. Wow. And uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. I've seen a lot of people come. I worked the last I worked the last show in the old opera house and the first show in the new opera house. There ain't many that's still alive that can say that. Uh, Jimmy Capps just passed away. Jimmy Capps was one of the finest guitar players you could ever want to be around, and and most meek. Him and Leon Rhodes were two. Uh, they, for them, knowing as much that they as they know, they always had time for you. They never, uh, they never pushed you away or shunned you or anything of that nature. Uh, two great guys, and I had the opportunity of working with them for the, all those 20 years. Uh, it's fun. It's been a fun life. Now, were you around when Porter passed on? Yes, I was. Uh, I attended. I attended. Uh, I attended Jim Ed's funeral. I, I attended uh, Del Rey's funeral. I attended uh, Porter's funeral. Uh, it's sad to see, and it hurts yeah. to see part of your life uh, disappear. Uh, even though that there, even though uh, that I've got something that a lot of folks don't have, uh, I have the memory of being around with them, uh, and seeing them for the way that they really are. They don't have to pretend. Uh, not saying that they ever did. Uh, I, Jim Ed and, and and Porter were the same any time that you, any time you was around them. Uh, well, Dale was. Dale was. Dale was. Dale's always felt like he had to keep us entertained, and and did. Uh, but he didn't have to. Uh, when we'd get on the bus, it was. I mean, it was almost like Dale was on. Dale was on stage 24 hours a day. Uh, Jim had liked his rest time, so did Porter. And 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 we knew we we could recognize when they was wanting that downtime. Uh, sometimes it was on the road. Sometimes it was home. Uh, but they, anybody that's ever been in the music industry and in, in, in that sense of the word, uh, even though they was not working, their mind always was. Uh, always thinking what other way could they entertain an audience or what they could say or what they could do, uh, what they could present in order to keep that to keep the attention of the audience. Uh, Jim Ed and, and Bob Blumen both were great impersonators. They, they <laughs> Bob was probably the best I ever saw at Walter Brennan. Uh, and Dale was he had Roy Acuff down to a T. In fact, Roy came out there, asked him, said he uh, told him one night on the opera, he said, I, I was sitting there watching you do me and he said, I, I was wondering if that was me out there doing it. Uh, if you're working in, in a position to where you're trying to entertain people, you have to give it all you got. And if you don't give it all you got, those people out in the audience, they, they recognize that. They know that. So you got to be at the top of your game. And, and one of the hardest things, I guess, when you're listening to a record well, I guess I don't know what you call it today because they don't play records anymore. But, but uh, when you're listening to a song and you're hearing the way it's played, and then you're expected to, to learn that 
and and reproduce it uh, on a stage somewhere, uh, you're not only listening just to the way it's played, uh, the song that it is, but you've got to deliver it the way that it was recorded. Uh, and you'd be surprised at the people that would recognize it if it's if it's not. So being on stage is a lot more than what people think that it is. Uh, even though we, uh, with, with my first year with Ernest, <clears throat> we worked one year, we worked 300 dates. We were gone 300 days away from the home. Now think about that, because think about how many days there, there is in a year. And we were on the road 300 dates that year. But people, even though he had passed, people did not want to cancel dates on Ernest. They loved him that much. And Ernest was a lovable per a person. And But Justin, his son, f filled in on all those dates. And people enjoyed Justin's about as Well, I'm not going to say that they enjoyed him as much as they would have his daddy. But they enjoyed Justin, too. And Justin did an, a, an excellent job of, of doing his daddy's material. Tell me this. Now, you got to work with one of the greatest duets of all time. Jim Ed Brown and Miss Helen Cornelius. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me some stories, what's going on, some interesting facts on that show. When we were in town and they had and they had songs to work up, or when we was <clears throat> when we were see we, we pre recorded all the music for that particular show. We go in the studio and pre record all that music and then when you seen us out live the only song that we did basically live was the opening song and the closing song the rest of it was pre-recorded and we set up there and acted like we were playing it now the guest a lot of times uh, now Jim and Helen did we did we we work with all of the, we work with everything that they did uh, and I'd always I always sang the third part and when Jim Ed did the, his sisters, when he did the stuff that he recorded with the sisters, uh, the piano player that we had at the time, his name was um, Tim Atwood, uh, he and I did the harmony parts with Jim Ed that his sisters had done with him on, on recording. Uh, but with Jim Ed and Helen, all the, all the harmony work, I did, I did that with them. Uh, Sometimes when we had four parts, uh, Tim would Tim would sing the fourth part there. Uh, but it was it was uh, you'd go in a studio. I mean, you'd go into the to practice, and you had a format a, a format the way that we were going to do it. You know, we would work maybe till lunchtime, go break and get you something to eat and come back, and maybe you'd go to three four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and rehearsals. Uh, we always put on a new show. We'd start the year every year. We'd start the, the, uh, the year off with a new show. And we'd, 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 do that, we'd do that show for six months before we would start working on a show for the next year. Now, we'd be working on this show while performing the other show. Uh, sometimes that got to be a little bit difficult because you're trying to remember everything that you're doing on the old stuff <laughs> and trying to work all the new stuff in with it but that was that was fun that was different now rumor in the business Jim Ed Brown was a little bit hard to work for is there any truth to that he could be uh, usually if Jim Ed got irritated or put out so to speak it was always because something was not going right. Uh, Jim Ed was not a, he couldn't pick up each instrument and play it, but he knew what he wanted. And uh, it wasn't that difficult. We had a, we had a band leader, uh, he, he's, he's since deceased, his name was Hank Corwin, that he he was one of the ones I was telling you that went to Juilliard. Uh, 
he had a music mind uh, and write some of the best charts that I had ever played. Uh, he taught me a lot, and I'm thankful for that. But he would a lot of times he would get together with Jim Ed to find out exactly how he wanted these. Of course, any time that they had recorded something, they always wanted you to play it on stage the way that they recorded it. Now there may that we only had a five-piece band. Uh, sometimes they would ask you to do things that you didn't have the instrument for it. But uh, Hank was a steel player, and he played a lot of horn parts. And of course, he was a school musician. He knew what to play and how to play it, and how to make it sound like it was should be sounded. Uh, there was not any. There was some rough times. Uh, you never go through anything without having some rough times. Yep. Uh, there were some rough times uh, with maybe Helen didn't like a song, or maybe Jim Ed didn't like a song, or whatever. But it, we would work it out to where we could do it with our own something that they not that they hadn't recorded because they, they used to do a lot of stuff that, that they had never recorded. Uh, and we would work it up. A lot of times we'd work it up for uh, the TV show, but we would use it a lot of times in open up, opening up our shows and stuff. Uh, because they would come on, a lot of times they would come on, Jim Ed would come on first, and then Helen would, he would walk off stage and Helen would come on, and then they would come back together and do all their duets and stuff. Uh, Helen didn't have, at that time, Helen didn't have, uh, because that was in the 70s, early 70s, um, <clears throat> Helen didn't have as many recordings out as Jim Ed did. Now, Jim Ed could probably sing to you all day long and never repeat himself of, of a song that he had recorded by himself over the years. Uh, Helen didn't, he, she wasn't fortunate enough to have that catalog to work with uh, so she would be she would she would copy not copy but she would cover a, a song maybe the Emily Lou Harris done or somebody like that uh, but she always did a good job and and we would and we all sat down and we tried to work it out to the best of our ability the way that they wanted it done well, let's talk about you for just a second, a little bit on your personal <laughs> life. Go on. Now, the music business, I imagine, is pretty tough on a family. You know, being gone, how many times you've been married, and tell me how many kids you got. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, let me tell you the good part first. I've got, yeah. I got three daughters. Wonderful. My oldest daughter is in the military, and she was set to, to, re, to re, uh, retire this year. But they offered her a, the way she put it to me, she said, Daddy, they offered me something I just couldn't refuse. So she's going to she's gonna stay in for another few years uh, in this position. And uh, my second daughter, uh, she's, she's, in the, she's into finance. Uh, my youngest daughter, she's um, uh, a stay-at-home mother. Uh, she she's my only daughter that graduated from college with a degree and I, I, at this at this time my mind's blank and I can't tell you what her degree is in but uh, I married for the first time I married uh, my childhood sweetheart uh, she still she's the mother of my two of my oldest two daughters uh, She's a good person. She and I still get along great, and that's good because of the kids. I mean, we don't get along with each other just because of the kids, but but uh, she was uh, she was. I still care for her, and I guess I always will. Uh, my second marriage, uh, marriage, being in the music industry, not always is the best industry to be in. While you're trying to, yeah, while you're trying to be at home, trying to be a, trying to be a family. But my second marriage, she, her father was a very famous man in the gospel music industry, 
and and um, don't know if you're familiar with gospel music industry or not, but my 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 father-in-law was JKS, and she traveled a lot with her dad, and a lot of times when I would be in town, she would be gone, and a lot of times when I'd be gone when she was in town, but uh, we we was able to have get together long enough to have a daughter, and. Uh, all of my daughters now are in their 40s or 50s. Uh, they're not, I'm not saying they're old, but they're not as young as they used to be. Uh, I've, got, I've got some beautiful grandchildren. Uh, my oldest grandson is, is, in, is in the military. He's in the Army. He's just re up for his second term, or second tour, I should say. Uh, I've got, now I think I've got four great-grandchildren uh, that I'm extremely proud of. Uh, my last, my last marriage, uh, you may have met her when you came in a while ago. Uh, she was my high school sweetheart. Is that right? And uh, she and I, when I moved back to Georgia in, 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 in 1988, I moved home. My dad was in real bad health. And my mom called and told me, she said, I need your help. I was the only single one. I, I had one brother and two sisters. I was a single, I was single and, and mother made, needed my help. And she said, I need your help. So I moved back home in 19, and July, July the 4th, 1988. And uh, I hadn't seen my wife since we were in school. And I, her mother came to my dad's wake and uh, shortly thereafter, she and I went, uh, we went out and obviously we got, later on we got married and we've been married, married now, I think some, something like 30 years. Wow. Uh, we have no children together. Uh, we were too daggum old to start something like that. <laughs> you know. Marriage and raising kids is for young folks. It's not for older folks. I, sometimes I can't tolerate me. So, <laughs> well, tell me this: back in the '70s and '80s, you know, there was a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot in the music industry. Did that ever affect you any at all? I can honestly sit here and I'm not telling you I didn't smoke a little dope because I did. Uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, I saw I saw a guy one night come close to death because because of drugs and uh, that scared me to death. I was in Texas one night and and went to a party that I was invited to that I didn't know what kind of party it was. I, I was just invited to a party and it turned out to be a drug party. And I somehow some way I took something that sent me on a trip. And my feet never never left the ground, but I said right then and there when I came to my senses, I said this won't never happen to me again. See, now I worked the Vegas circuit for three years. Now we'll go to a different kind of drug, and that's alcohol. Uh, when you work in Vegas or the Vegas circuit, you never back then you never paid for a paid for a drink. And you never you, you never bought a you never bought a smoke. Uh, if you're in these casinos, they, if you're a smoker, you, they bring you something to smoke. If you're a drinker, they bring you something to drink. And uh, I was never what you might say a heavy drinker, because I, I only got I've only been drunk twice in my life. And I said after I did that, I won't never do that again. And I've stuck to my grounds, and I've never been drunk but twice, and that was in my younger years. Uh, I was never a heavy smoker. I did smoke, but I was never heavy a smoker. And when and I just decided one day that I was going to quit smoking, and I carried a. Uh, I I dated Porter's daughter for quite some time, and she had two children. And her oldest child asked me one day if they had a school project, and they was to get. And their school project was to get one person 
to quit smoking for 24 hours. Well, she asked me if I would do that, and she asked me that on Friday. Well, I was working the Opry on Friday night, and I forgot that I was not supposed to smoke. And I smoked Friday night. So she asked me on Saturday if I smoked, and I told her, yeah, I did. I said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll go 24 hours without smoking because I didn't abide by the rule that I, I, I told you I would. So I went. I took 24 hours at a time. I quit smoking 24 hours at a time. And I, when I quit, I have never picked them back up, and I don't miss them. Well, look at you. You look healthy. I mean, you look good. I ain't bad. Being for, on the road all these years. I ain't bad for 70, 73 years wow. old. Wow. <laughs> I can still pull my, my load. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. Now, did you ever compete in the songwriter market? No. That was not... That was not there was enough of them out there that was writing good songs that they didn't need my, they didn't need my input. Uh, been around a lot of, I, I've been around a lot of, I used to get to do a lot of demos, what they referred to as demos in Nashville. Uh, uh, I think me or you one was talking, me or Joey one was talking about Terry Schultz a while ago. Uh, Terry Schultz used to be a, a DJ in, in North Carolina, and that's when I met him when he was in North Carolina as a DJ. Well, he came to Nashville, and he got in with a record company, and he called me and started using me to demo the songs that the, the, the writers uh, had had written, and they had much rather somebody else sing them than, than them. And I would, I, Terry would call me and say, hey, I got some songs I need for you to, uh, to demo. And believe it or not, uh, it, it, I'm trying to think of her name, but she went. She went on. She when we had duos, and she would come in to do the duos, and uh, I can't think of her name. Sylvia, not Sylvia. Um, can't think of her name, but uh, I saw her. I saw her on doing a show one night. And I walked up to her and I said, and I told her who I was. I said, Do you remember me? She said, Yes, I do. And we, like I say, we used to do some, some duets together on some songs that was written that were written for duets. That, that she and I did that, and it, and it was, it, it made me feel good to know that she still remembered me after all them years, because there's been a bunch of them underneath. There's a lot of water's gone <laughs> under that wood, under that bridge. <clears throat> but it's just been fun. I bet so. Well, tell me this. You've answered all my questions. Is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers uh, that I've not asked you about? Anything you'd like to share? I can't say that. Uh, I got into the music because of the love of music. I stayed in the music industry because of the love of music. There's a lot of things change over the years. The basic music has always stayed with us and always will be. I'm not particularly fond of the way that they've presented country music of the today of today in today's society. I'm not telling you that it's wrong. I'm just telling you that it's something that I'm not accustomed to hearing. Uh, when I turn my radio on in my vehicle or in the house or whatever, I don't expect. I'm, I'm expecting to hear country music because that's what I listened to and that's what I was part of my life for so many years but it's got to where you cannot tell the music apart uh, I'm not putting anybody down for it they have to play what they have to play like I had to play what I wanted to play I love country music I will go to my grave loving country music and I'll participate any time that I get an opportunity to participate, as long as it's country music. I won't. I won't be a rock and roll player. I'm not a rock and roll player. Don't want to be a rock and roll player. Now I respect the musicianship that it takes to play it. I've seen some guitar players that just absolutely blew my mind. But I can sit and listen to them because they're good at what they do. They know their trade. Uh, but my pick of music is country music because it's heartfelt. Uh, 
the person that wrote that song felt that song when he was writing it. Some of these rock and roll tunes that you hear, you can't understand a word, half of the words they say. Again, I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying that that's my, that's my view of it. Country music is my love, and I will always like country music. I love gospel music, but gospel music is changing too. It's not like the gospel music that you used to, that I used to listen to when I was growing up. Uh, and my ex-father-in-law, like I was speaking, of course, he's, he's since deceased, but him being the man that he was, uh, he was involved with a lot of different well-known, I couldn't mention some names, but I won't. Uh, there were good people. And there's a lot of them that are still out there. A lot of them, a lot of them have, a, a lot of them have passed on. And, and, and it's, it's good to see them on some of the replays of music. Uh, a lot of times you'll see a lot of country players playing some of the gospel music because now the, the, the music, the gospel music and country music have come so close to being together. Uh, you'll see a lot of country players playing on, playing on uh, some of the gospel music sessions and, and, and shows. Uh, that's also a part of my life. Part of your heartstrings, too. Part of the heartstrings, that's absolutely. Right. You know, you you don't know this, but I have a classic country radio station, and I bet you that I have probably played you on my classic country radio station. That's my favorite as well. So I have really enjoyed that. Um, you know, so I'm a, I'm also a big fan of classic country. That's oh, my man. favorite. <laughs> some of those songs, well. you, some of those songs are even being brought back again today. Now they're being brought back in a in a in a way that I'm not real. I'm not real fond of, but they're still good songs. Uh, you can't expect a, well, for instance, I, I'll put it this way. The way that you would I listen to a song and the way I listen to a song probably be a different way, but that don't mean either one of us is wrong. Uh, I love music. If it's, if it's presented right, I love music and I'll listen to it. Funny, I had a new radio put in my truck today. And I couldn't wait to to turn it on and and and, and listen to it, but I couldn't find no country music. <laughs> that's why, and I was all set. I was all set and ready to play, but that's all right. I got CDs. I, Lord knows I got CDs. <laughs> uh, a lot of the artists that I work with, I've got I've got a bunch of their CDs, so uh, I can still listen to the to that. Well, I'll give you an idea here in just a few moments as well. Well, tell me also, what are you doing today? What, what's going on today in your life? Where are you playing at? I'm not. Wouldn't mind be playing somewhere. Um, you know, I've, I've reached the age and time that it don't take a whole lot of money to get my attention. Uh, people, I know somebody told me one time, said, man, I'd call you, but I can't afford you. If it's good music, I've been known to play for free. I enjoy music. And if it's something that I enjoy and people that I enjoy with, that's worth, that, that's, that's your pay right there. Uh, if you work with somebody that argues all the time and, and can't, and, and nobody, somebody, there's always an agitator in there somewhere, I'm not gonna be a part of that. I, I, I don't, I go out, there's a lo local place here it's called Milltown. Uh, I see a lot of friends at Milltown. Uh, I'm real. I'm friend. I'm friends with the guy that runs it, and he lets me know when certain groups are coming into town, and and if there's a chance that I know some. Uh, Gene Watson's coming to town before too very long, and I'm, I'm gonna go see Gene because well I know Gene plus I know some of his players, and plus I'm a Mason. And there's a lot of those players that are that are, that are Masons. There's a lot. Of, there was a lot of players that was on the Opry that were Masons. Uh, that most people don't know that Mel Tillis was a 33rd degree Mason. Uh, Roy Clark was a 33rd degree Mason. 
And a 33rd, I'm a 32nd degree, a 33rd, at that 33rd degree you have to earn. That ain't just handed out to you, you got to earn that. And, and uh, but I, I like to play and I, I will play if there's, I, I'm not fond of playing jam sessions uh, because most of the time those turn, those turn into rock and roll sessions. Uh, not saying it's not good playing or whatever, it's just that that's not my cup of tea. But I, I still enjoy playing. I don't play much anymore. People don't want a person my age anymore. You know, they, they want somebody that looks pretty on stage. And uh, you can tell my, my, my beard, I'm white-headed. <laughs> so that means I ain't no spring chicken. Well, I uh, think you still look pretty. <laughs> got that nice hat on. Yes, sir. I'm going to have my hat. Yes, sir. I got one or two. Yeah, well, Mr. Jerry, it has been such a pleasure having you on our show. Yes. Thank you for being on Trails to Fame with us today. And uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, it would be my pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Trails to Fame. Please send your thoughts and comments to joey at jmppro.com. We also invite you to like us on facebook.com forward slash j-p-productions. See you next time on Trails to Fame.